Good morning! Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Friends, welcome to worship at Leroy UMC, whether you're in person uh, or, or joining us online, whether it's uh, Bar Barbara out in California or Lee and Lola, Phil and Frida. I know you guys are watching. We're happy to have you with us. Uh, but friends, before we begin the service this morning, a couple reminders as always. Uh, we have Sunday school for any of our young disciples ages 4 through 6th grade. Uh, that is in the education wing downstairs. Uh, they're all more than welcome to join. We also have kind of a, a nursery space uh, set up uh, out here in Fellowship Hall. Uh, we're streaming the service out there to a TV. There's some toys and things. Uh, if any uh, disciples, young disciples need to run around, feel free to use that space. Uh, and here in the sanctuary, in all of your pews, uh, in each of the pews should be prayer cards. If you have a joy or a concern, anything you want to lift up, fill that out, leave it in the offering plate. Uh, there should also be sermon notes if you want to jot down a verse, if, if any, any notes you want to uh, yeah, take any notes at any point. Uh, and also giving cards if you want to support all of our ministries, all the things we're up to. But friends, uh, as we look for Christ among us, I would invite us to join, as always, in saying our church family prayer. It's the prayer of the church family that we always hope Christ is making us into. Friends, let us pray. Christ, Christ make, make us your hands. hands. By the way we serve our neighbor with authentic compassion and make us your family by the way we love one another with unconditional grace. Friends, let us worship the Lord. Please stand or sit however you feel most comfortable worshiping our Lord. One, two, three, four. Quiet. We 
Dear God, thank you so much for joining us here today. God, I know that so much of this world is so messy, so divisive. Sometimes it's so hard to find you, especially when we feel too dirty, too unclean, to come to you when all you ask of us is just to come as you are and God I thank you so much for coming here not to wash the feet of the righteous but to wash the feet of people like me the sinner and God we thank you so much for what your son did for us in Jesus name we pray amen I've been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bend. I've held everything together and watched the shadow. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender. Chased my heart adrift and drifted home again. Plunder blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption. And every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there. I was found before I was lost. For all my mistakes and that part just rests me and I know I don't deserve this kind of love somehow this kind of love is who you are it's 
a grace that can never add up to be somebody you still want somehow. Love me as you find But if this borrowed breath is yours, Lord, take it all. You are faithful and you are gracious, and I'm just grateful to think you don't need a single thing and still want my heart. I was found before I was lost. I was yours before I was found. For all my mistakes, and that part just wrecks me. And I know I don't deserve this kind of love somehow. This kind of love is who you are. It's a grace I can never add up. Somebody you still want somehow love me as you find me love me as you find me yes God love me as you find me your love's too good to leave me love me as you find me your love's too good to leave me told the worship team we're getting upon Pentecost so expect at least one song that references fire every week uh, so this is that song but um, I just wanted to real quick uh, just it's on my heart about change uh, I know that change is hard it's difficult sometimes we uh, as humans we just want to avoid it at all costs and what I want to say is, for God, let's embrace that change. For this church, let's embrace these changes. And for God, let's embrace this change, okay?
shed on the cross when you died for the sins of men and you let out a cry crucified now alive in me these hands are yours teach them to serve as you please and I'll reach out desperate to see all the greatness of God may my soul rest in you and I'll never be the same and I'll never be the same no no I'll never be the same cause I know never be the same, and I'll never be the same, no, no, I'll never be the same. Friends, this time I would invite us to join ourselves together as we pray with, with God's words this morning, with the words of Scripture and pray through a Scripture passage, uh, and also as we listen for uh, maybe a verse that God might have for us to carry with us into the week ahead. Uh, and so I would invite us to pray responsibly. I will lead us and then invite all of you to respond with a verse uh, as we pray with the words of Ezekiel 36. Friends, let us join together. The nations will know that I am God, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will take, take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. 
I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people. I will be your God. Friends, let us join our hearts and minds together as we take all things to Christ. Please pray with me. Holy God, may you reach out this morning and may you reach out in this moment to place a new heart and a new spirit in each one of us. Creator, may you revive the faith that you once stirred in us and remind us of that part that you have written for us in your story of salvation. Maker, may you restore the image you once made for us and show us that, that man, that woman that you always hoped we would one day become. Savior, may you renew the joy that you once filled us with and remind us of all our many reasons to be grateful and to be at rest. Lord, come and take the weight of all the burdens and trials we carry. May you give us space to breathe. Give us a moment to sit in your presence and be revived. And Lord, restore to us the joy of your salvation and the peace of knowing that you are God. And in this quiet moment, Lord, help us to feel your hand at work in our life as we commit everything to your loving care. Holy God, reach out to place a new heart and a new spirit in us that we might be new men and new women and find the new life that you have made us for. We ask this in the name of Christ Jesus as we pray with the words that Christ himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, Easter is officially behind us. Pentecost uh, is on its way. And so this morning we are starting a new worship series together uh, that we are calling Acts, the Method of Our Story. Uh, and the whole idea behind this series is that over the next few weeks, uh, we'll be talking together, looking at the book of Acts. Uh, Acts in the Bible is the story of the earliest church, uh, and it's always a, an appropriate book of the Bible to read after Easter. Acts is basically the sequel to the gospel. It's the, it's the story of what happened to the disciples after Jesus rose and after Jesus left. Uh, where did they go? All the things that kept happening. Uh, however, at the same time, as we talk about the history of the earliest church and as we talk about Acts... Uh, we're also going to be talking a little bit about the history of our church and of our tradition. Uh, we'll be talking about Methodism, uh, where Methodism began, uh, and what, what's unique about it, what sets it apart. Uh, and as we start our new series, we're actually starting, starting our uh, read through Acts by starting at the end of the book. Uh, we're taking a look at Acts chapter 28, 
uh, verse 16 to give it a little context, and then verses 30 and 31. It is the very end of the book of Acts. Uh, it's a short reading, but there's a lot there. So friends, listen now for the word of the Lord. When we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once again, holy God, we have gathered to hear words of renewal, words of peace, and words of new life. And so once again, Lord, only your words will do. So God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. You could not imagine a more picture-perfect ending than that. After decades of working to spread the gospel all across the Mediterranean, after risking his life and after establishing churches and cities from Corinth to Philippi to Ephesus, Paul's story finally draws to a close with Paul comfortable, happy, with a cozy little house in Rome, welcoming all who came to him proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And Paul lived happily ever after the end. It just warms your heart. However, there is one small problem with that picture-perfect ending. It didn't happen. Some of us might know the fuller story. In the last few chapters of the book of Acts, Paul is arrested in Jerusalem. As a Roman citizen, Paul appeals his case to the high court in Rome. When Paul gets there, he finds that the backlog of cases is so long that it would take years before his case is actually heard. So in the meantime, Paul is given a little house and even freedom to keep on meeting with people, to go on preaching. And that is where the book of Acts ends. Chapter 28, verse 31. But the thing is, in actual historical fact, just a year or two after Paul arrived in Rome, and just a year or two after that picture-perfect ending in the year 64 A.D., Paul was caught up in one of the very first persecutions against the Christian church in Rome. He was led outside the city walls, and there Paul was executed, beheaded for being a leader of the early church. But that isn't the happily ever after ending we get from Acts. I mean, happily ever after, the man was martyred, saying that Paul lived happily ever after would be like ending the movie Titanic with Jack and Rose holding hands out on the bow of the ship and never mentioning that inconvenient little detail about the iceberg that hit a couple days later. Yes, Paul made it to Rome, and yes, Paul preached there, but Paul also died there, a very tragic and difficult death. But here's the really interesting thing about it. Or here's the thing that doesn't add up or make much sense. Not only was Paul killed in Rome, but Luke, the author who wrote the book of Acts, knew that that is what happened. Luke was one of Paul's traveling companions. He had very personal, first-hand knowledge of Paul's story. In fact, he was there. That's one of the most unique or special things about the book of Acts. If you read through Acts and you pay attention to the pronouns, the pronouns will change from talking about he and them to talking about I and we every so often. Luke is sometimes part of what's going on. You may have noticed that in verse 16, when we 
came to Rome, Luke is there. Plus, Luke wrote the book of Acts. He finally sat down and put it all together many years after all of this had happened, after Paul's death had become common knowledge, meaning that even though he knew Paul had been executed, for some reason Luke still chose to end the book of Acts in chapter 28 with Paul alive and well, preaching without hindrance. And the great question that gets debated by biblical scholars in seminary classrooms is why? Why does the book of Acts end with Paul preaching with all boldness and without hindrance when, in actual fact, Paul's own story ended in death? As strange as it may seem, I think that Maybe the best way to try and answer that question about the book of Acts' mysterious ending is to line up Paul's story with the story of another preacher who lived many centuries after Paul named John Wesley. Now, John Wesley should be a name that we're all familiar with. Wesley was the founder of Methodism, of our church tradition. Uh, more than that, his name can still be seen on every Wesleyan college, Wesleyan hospital, Wesleyan township, and yes, millions of Wesleyan Methodist churches. He is a person so famous, they even make John Wesley bobbleheads now, which is also how we make all important decisions here at the church. We have a little John Wesley bobblehead, see if he shakes his head or <laughs> yes or no. However, uh, as famous as his name may be, not many people really know what John Wesley is famous for, what he really did. So here's a little bit of a, a crash course, a really short history. John Wesley was an Anglican priest, which means he was a minister in the Church of England, in England, in the 1700s. And the 1700s was not a particularly wonderful time and place. There was a lot of political unrest, a lot of poverty, inequality, illiteracy, and disease was everywhere, and it was also a time of great spiritual turmoil. In the early 1700s, in England, Christianity had by and large become a very proper, formal, impersonal thing. Most people didn't read the Bible in order to try and understand what God's word for their life was, but they heard someone else read the Bible as part of a formal ritual called worship. Most people didn't think of church as a living body that you were a member of, but people saw church as an established institution governed by protocols and etiquettes, and most people didn't believe in Jesus by having a personal relationship with him as your savior, but people believed by showing up and going through the motions when required. And at the risk of oversimplifying his life, at that time and in that place, John Wesley was one of the most important reformers doing everything that they could to make Christianity personal again. For John Wesley and the early Methodists like him, guys like George Whitfield and Francis Asbury and his brother Charles Wesley, faith for them isn't supposed to be about having your name on membership rolls or going through the rituals. Faith is meant to be a way of living. For Wesley, church isn't supposed to be an institution. It's supposed to be the place where the Holy Spirit actually shows up and turns ordinary men and women into the hands of God Almighty. But above all, Jesus Christ isn't supposed to be a long past historical figure, but Jesus is meant to be a living Lord who called you to follow and saved you from your sins because Jesus is a Savior who wants a very real, very personal relationship with you. 
And the reason John Wesley and the early Methodists believed all of these things is because ultimately, somehow, Wesley believed that the gospel story is a story that didn't end. That may be the real significance of John Wesley and the Methodist movement he started at a time when religion had largely become a very formal, impersonal thing. Methodism was about leading men and women to a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, with grace, with church, with scripture, with faith, with all of this, by showing them that the gospel story just a story. It's our story. It's your story. Of course, there is so much more that you could say about Methodism, and so much more that we'll try and say about it and try and cover over the next few weeks, but somewhere behind all of that history, somewhere behind all the, the tent revivals, all the small groups, the colleges, the hospitals, the orphanages, the missions and churches that John Wesley and the Methodists started, somewhere behind all of it was that single absolute conviction that God is not a distant, indifferent being off somewhere in the clouds, God is someone you can experience and get to know as much as you can get to know the neighbor next door. And that the story of how God became a human being in order to forgive us, to call us, to lift us, is not just a myth that we hear about in church on Sunday morning. It's a story that we are a part of just as much as we're a part of the story of our, our family, our, the story of our marriage, the story of our career, or any other story we might give our life to. John Wesley believed that every single person, every last one of us, can be a disciple, can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, can be a character in God's story of salvation. It's your God, your Savior, and your story. You can experience it, see it, feel it, touch it, and live it. And that isn't just something that John Wesley believed in the 1700s, but 1,700 years prior to that, that is also the most likely reason why Luke chose to end the book of Acts the way he did. Luke knew that Paul had died in Rome. Luke knew that the last note in Paul's story was a note of tragic martyrdom and loss. But Luke also knew that he couldn't end his book, his story about the early church, on that note. He couldn't let death have the last word as if the Holy Spirit had somehow been stopped or as if the light of life had somehow been snuffed out. No, instead, Luke very purposefully, very intentionally chose to bring the story of the church to a close on a note of hope, with the gospel being preached boldly and without hindrance because the good news is that the story did not end with Paul. The gospel didn't stop spreading just because Paul's sermon stopped. The gospel kept spreading and new disciples kept on believing all the way down to the moment you believed. God did not stop working just because Luke ran out of pages, but the miracles kept happening and the Spirit kept moving all the way down to all the ways God is working in your life. And the story did not end just because one character named Paul reached the conclusion of his part in the story, but there were millions more characters, more disciples, more preachers, more teachers, more healers, all the way down to the part you have to play. That is why the book of Acts ends with Paul 
preaching with all boldness and without hindrance, even though Paul's own story ended in death. Because it's not just Paul's story. It's our story. It's your story. Luke knew that Paul had died, but Luke chose to end his story on a note of confident, hopeful life Because the truth is, the book of Acts and the story of the church is a story that has no end. The story kept going. Chapters are still being written in the book of Acts to this day, and you are part of it. The good news behind that last verse in the book of Acts is that Acts does not end with a final definite period it only draws to a temporary close with a dot 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 that invites us and invites you to pick up the pen and write the next chapter the gospel story of how god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and the church story of how that son called ordinary men and women to come and get to know him personally is a story that God has not stopped writing. We are in it now. You are a member of Christ's body. You are a disciple in the gospel. You are a character in God's story, and God still has so much more in store. That's the miracle. All those Bible stories, all those scriptures that we read aren't just history, it's real. These things happened. They are still happening. God is not done changing lives or working miracles. Jesus is not done calling or choosing disciples. The only question is, what part will you play? What chapter will you write? From Paul preaching without hindrance in Rome to John Wesley leading people to a personal experience with Christ, the good news is that Paul's story, the story of the church, the story of Pentecost, and the story of Methodism all remind us that the gospel story is not just a story, it's your story. And there are still so many incredible, astounding, life-giving chapters in the story left to be written. And thanks be to God for it. Amen. Friends, please pray with me. Holy God, every time we hear your scriptures read or listen to your story of salvation, Lord, help us to find all our reasons to give thanks for the miracle that the story is not over yet. Lord, give us eyes to see and faith to embrace our part in the story. Help us to be that that healer, that teacher, mentor, missionary, that character that you imagine. And give us the strength to play our role with joy and with gladness. In Christ Jesus, as we come to find our part in the story, let us come to find you and to know you as our Savior. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. My name is Tammy Worshi Kessinger. I will be your incoming pastor at the end of June, um, effective July 1st. I am really excited to meet all of you, and I hear you have some questions. Oh, wow. Favorite hymn. That would be a toss-up probably between um, It Is Well With My Soul and Amazing Grace. And possibly the hymn of promise. Um, that is one of my favorites also. Um, hmm. Stepmom 
and um, probably The Stand by Stephen King. <laughs> Um, Chesapeake Shores, actually. Um, been watching that one lately. Before that, it was um, another one of those Hallmark series shows that I watched. Um, I do a lot of Peacock shows, so. Um, and of course, Days of Our Lives. Gotta watch that. Uh, the music. Absolutely love the music. Um, and I am, I am traditional, but I am contemporary. And so I, I love listening to um, the music that just wants to throw your hands up in the air and just praise and, um, but then I also like those hymns that just speak to your soul, so. So since I've started watching The Chosen, I think my, my favorite Bible character has moved to, there's two, Mary Magdalene and Matthew, um, just by the way the actor in The Chosen plays him and just the way he comes across. Well, friends, the, the story of the church is a story that has no ending. It keeps going, and we are all a part of it. Uh, and so we, we do have uh, a new pastor who will be starting this summer. Uh, em and I are heading down to St. Louis, but Pastor Tammy will be coming, helping lead the church family in all the new chapters that are ahead. Uh, and we hope to keep finding little ways to, to introduce her to you all. Uh, and so look, be on the lookout for more videos or more uh, information as we get closer to the summer. But friends, uh, we are called as a church family to be Christ's hands of service, Christ's family of grace, each one of us. Uh, and so every Sunday we always have uh, an offering time as a way to invite you to have an impact, to be Christ's hands in a real way. Uh, we have all kinds of ministries here at the church, youth groups and, and blood drives, Feed My Sheep, a million things. Uh, we're thankful for any support you might have for those ministries. Uh, so in a second we'll have offering plates going around or uh, you can always text to give. Uh, but friends, I'd invite us to continue to worship the Lord through all the gifts that we bring.
uh, before we end the service. As always, a couple of announcements, things coming up. Uh, number one, next Sunday uh, is the fifth Sunday, and so we are going to have uh, a church potluck after the worship service. Um, so we'll have the 9 a.m. service, and then 10 o'clock, out in Fellowship Hall, uh, all kinds of meals. We'd invite you to stick around, uh, join us for a meal, get to know, get to know all your brothers and sisters uh, in the church family. There should be uh, a sign-up genius that's going around if you want to bring, bring a dish or bring a meal. Uh, I should also mention, you know, we're talking about the history of Methodism. I don't know if anything is more definitively Methodist than a potluck. Uh, so this is a way to honor our heritage. Uh, but that is next Sunday, uh, the potluck after worship. Uh, after that, May 7th, so two Sundays from now, we have uh, Youth Sunday. Our youth group is taking over, leading the worship service. It's always a lot of fun. And then after the 9 a.m. service at 10 o'clock, uh, we have May Madness. Uh, that is out in the parking lot. We bring a food truck, uh, Carl's ice cream, all kinds of games. There's a guy who makes balloon animals. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so we'd invite all of you, the family, all your neighbors, invite folks uh, to join us. It is a fun event. That will be on May 7th, two Sundays from now. Uh, and then just a reminder, keep bringing uh, full-size shampoo bottles for Home Sweet Home and keep bringing in stamps or, or the whole empty envelope. Uh, drop off for those is here in the entryway. Those go to, to Home Sweet Home and to a stamp ministry we're supporting. But friends, with that shared, I'd invite you to receive the final blessing. Now go forth into the world to find your part in God's story of salvation. Go forth to find that preacher, teacher, minister, healer, all the things that God has in store for you and to embrace all of them with gladness. And may the, may the blessing of Almighty God be with each and every one of you now and evermore. Amen. Friends, the service is ended. Go in peace.